All praise be to God Almighty, and peace and blessing may be upon His messengers and their righteous followers till the Day of Judgment. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you today to our program about the spiritual dimension of worship. With me today, Dr. Basim Hamid, a medical doctor and also a doctor of the matters of the hearts. Dr. Hamid is an instructor at Mishka Islamic University. Also, he's an author and a poet. Welcome, Dr. Hamid, to our program. Thank you. I'm pleased to be with you tonight. Glad to have you. Every religion has its own sets of worships and rites. Islam has its own worship. And today, we're going to discuss the spiritual dimension in the worship of Islam. Dr. Hamid, as a Muslim, as an instructor, as a spiritual teacher, would you please tell us a little bit about the concept of worship in Islam and its spiritual dimension? Sure. That's a very intriguing and uh, important question around which the core of all worshiping activities revolve. As a Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us in the Qur'an that He has honored the human being and elevated His level over all species as a matter of fact all over all the creation and He made all the creation to serve the human being. He said, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ I have indeed honored the human being. And if you look where does this honor lay? What is that special honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to a human being over other creation? When you search in the Quran, you find an important verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered the angels to make a prostration to Adam, who was the first human being created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that prostration was not for his physical being. Allah said, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ I want to stop you here. Is there a divine elements? Does that imply there is a divine element in the human being or that's just a so, metaphor? So the ayah translates as, so once I have made this a human being and instilled within him my soul, then do prostrate for him. So my soul is not like a piece of God, it's not a segment of God, but it's something that belongs to God. So it's an honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, like as if he's saying when you say Baytullah, this is the house of Allah. It's not like where God lives. It's just Allah is honoring this place Beautiful. by ascribing it to him. It's like as if you're saying, this is my place. It's not part of you, but it belongs to you. Same thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually emphasizing the importance of the soul, the spirit of the human being says, like this is this belongs to me. It's not part of God, it's not a divine aspect of God, but He's the one who made it, He's the one who instilled it in the human being. So Allah points out that once the soul occupies that physical structure of the human being, 
than he deserves to be prostrated for. So the spiritual component of the human being is what Allah has honored him with and that's what makes him a unique creation and that's how he honored him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in order for us to elevate our souls and connect it to its creator, this is how this is where the worshiping activities come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this structure, the human being. It has the physical component and it has the, st the spiritual component. That is the soul, that is the heart, that is the mind, that is the nafs, that is the ruh. In order... Could you translate those terms for those viewers who are not familiar, familiar with these terms? So very much the mind, the heart, uh, the spirit or the soul may represent one important element or one ingredient of the human being that could be translated as the fuad or the qalb or the nafs or the ruh. And there are some detailed technical uh, differences between them, but in a sense they represent the non-physical structure of the human being that comprehends, that feels, that connects to Allah and this is where the effect of the worshipping activities show and manifest. So back to the point that such as you nourish your physical structure by eating and drinking in order to remain strong and healthy and in order to preserve the well-being of your body and the, the growth spirit also to and the growth and the thriving same thing for the soul to thrive and remain healthy and connected to the creator it has to be nourished beautiful and that nourishment can only be achieved by what allah has made it means for it to be nourished with when allah created the physical structure of the human being he has ordained that it is the food it is the nutrition it is certain ingredients that would keep it healthy. He is the creator and he's the one who prescribed what keeps the soul healthy and what makes it the site of light and a site of comprehension that would also comprehend and connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is non-physical. In order to mingle with the physical structure you have your body. And in order to connect to the non-physical structure, the metaphysical structure, you need the soul. And that's where the ibadah, where the worshipping activities in, uh, in Islam acquires that importance. So through a set of services, whether it's the prayers, the fasting, the pilgrimage, and meditation, and dhikr, which is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you keep your soul healthy and you keep it connected to Allah, to its creator. Back again to the worship. Most of the worship in most religion is a form of me mechanical rituals and rites. How does that connect? We're talking about the metaphysical dimension. How these physical movements, physical actions can connect with the divine, with the spiritual world? how it can connect the human being, the physical being, with the non-physical being? That's a very good question. Let's take an example in order to make this point clearer. One of the main activities in Islam is the prayers. When you pray, you pray five times a day as a mandatory prayer for every Muslim. You stand up, you make certain recitations, you bow, and you make prostrations. This represents, um, just for clarity of the example, as if you want to drink a glass of water. In order to drink, you need the glass, which is the container of the water, and you also need the water inside. The mechanical and the physical aspects of the prayer is just like the glass. And then you have the water that is the spiritual dimension 
of the worshiping activities. The prayer as physical movements without a spiritual aspect is just like having an empty glass of water. So why do we need these physical, uh, physical movements as part of the prayer as opposed to just mere meditation, even meditation actually has some physical component of it. So in Islam, when you pray five times a day, let's just start with the uh, number of the prayers a day. Why are they five times a day? They are scattered throughout the day from dawn to late evening where you have periodic stations. You pause, disconnect yourself from the world and back to remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your battery has run out, so it's time to recharge it spiritually by connecting yourself to the Lord, by just plugging yourself back into Beautiful spirit. And it's time to cool down, pause, and focus back, because Allah is telling you, this is how I want you to live this life. This is how good you have to be to yourself. You have to be good to the people around you. So it's a reminder. And in order to do that, you need a spiritual charge. So you do that in the morning before you start the day. So when you leave the house to your work to mingle with people, you've already got that nourishment of your soul. So you're able to live according to the guidance of Allah, which is the perfect, the perfect guidance according to which you will excel in this life and you'll be good to people around you. In the middle of the day, in the afternoon, at sundown, and before you go to bed. So these are periodic stations that allows you to recharge the battery. The prayer itself, before you pray, you have to wash. You have to perform an ablution. And that by itself you have to feel that the water is washing your sins away. Whatever you've committed erroneously with your eye, with your ears, with your mouth, with your tongue, with your hands, you have to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, I am repenting to you. I am not a perfect human being, but I would like to be better. So now, it is a metaphorical aspect of ablution by washing your physical structure with the water. But at the same time, you feel like anything you've done wrong is being washed away. And this is a form of washing the sins away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabina wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin. Allah loves those who repent, which is the spiritual purity the spiritual cleanliness. Also those who preserve the physical cleanliness. After this spiritual shower and physical cleanliness, you start the prayer itself. So when you stand to pray, you start by facing Mecca, where all Muslims on earth face one place. This gives you a sense of unity where everyone has the same focus. Why is it Mecca? This is the first place on earth where Allah was worshipped. So you go back and reconnect with all the righteous servants of God from the beginning of time, from Adam, peace be upon him, till our time, that we are following the same path. That's the path of reconnection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having that feeling by itself, by facing Mecca, is very comforting and tranquilizing. Because you don't feel alone. You feel like you're part of a huge family, starting with Adam and continues till our present time. When you stand for the prayers, you say, Allahu Akbar. So why is that physical movement important? You're reciting by your tongue saying Allah is the great or the greatest, meaning Allah is greater than my fears. Allah is greater than anyone else. Allah is greater than anything on earth. And I am focusing on Allah. Allah is my priority now. 
So why do you do this? Now, all the world is behind my back and I'm coming and focusing on one thing and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you start reciting certain supplications by saying, Oh Allah, I'm coming forth to you, focusing on you, making your satisfaction, your pleasure, my main goal and my main priority. And then you start reciting certain verses. And the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned a beautiful hadith in which he said, How is the salah divided between you and Allah? It is not one-way traffic. It is two-way traffic. It is between you and Allah and back from Allah to you. And the Prophet said, Allah says, I have divided the prayers into two parts, between me and my servant. So if my servant says, that's the beginning of the prayer, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise be to Allah, the Lord of all the creation. Allah come commence that servant amongst the angels and say my servant is praising you so while you're standing there reciting it you feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is remembering you and when you say ar-rahman ar-rahim the most merciful the most gracious then Allah says my servant is complimenting me so you feel that Allah is honoring you, Allah is admiring what you're doing. And then Maliki Yawmiddin, the one in whose hand the position of the Day of Judgment, meaning the one who has the kingdom, the sovereignty, and the authority over everything. So Allah says, my servant has exalted me. So when you feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you, and is commending on what you're saying, you have that power and you have that pleasure and you have that satisfaction. You're special in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have that opportunity to connect to the Creator and no one else has that opportunity. You're unique, you're special in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you say, Iyaka na'bud. It is you that I worship and no one else. You don't think of anything else. And by worshiping also and living this life, and it is you that I seek the help of and no one else. And there is a very nice linguistic aspect here that you don't say, I seek your help. You say, it is you that I seek the help, meaning Allah is first. His worship is first and his help is first. When Allah hears this, said, this servant who is devout to me, is dedicated to me, deserves that I answer his prayers and respond to his needs. And whatever he's asking for, he will be he So will be every granted. prayer basically is starting with praising Allah and declaring the submission to him and realizing his dominions and his mind. Every single prayer starts with the same recitation. Beautiful. So you're back to the basics, back to the Creator, back to talking to the Lord, and back to reminding yourself that He's your Creator and you live by His guidance. You are His servant, but you're not alone. He's with you, He's supporting you, and He's helping you and he is responding to your needs and answering your prayers. So you say, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Oh Allah, guide me to the straight path. And Allah takes your hand, holds your hand, and walk you through the straight path for faith and for life. So you're not left alone. So all your needs, you feel like you're not the one who is handling life. You're not the one who just responsible for provision. You feel that there is a divine help, divine mercy always surrounding you and always guides you to what's best for you in this life, physically, spiritually, and in the hereafter, which is the ultimate goal of satisfaction to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So 
you go through all these verses and you think about it. So there is a reason why you stand and pause and detach from the world. Face one place, not shift from right to left. You're just focused. You're giving your undivided attention to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's like, you know, if you're sitting to someone who's talking to you or you're talking to one, you don't just go right and left and uh, wander with your eyes That's and right. body. That's you right. just you focus. focus. You're doing this to Allah. That physical movement allows you, allows you that focus. And even if you don't get it from the first time, by repetition and by training, just like a workout, it becomes a habit, becomes a second nature. You're coming in to explain in little details about the prayers in Islam, which is different from the prayer in different uh, religions. It's two components, the supplication, the praise, and the physical movements, where other religions might refer to the prayer, specifically to your communication, your supplication to Allah. You're requesting something from God Almighty. Now, you're taking us through the prayer in Islam. There are other worships we're going to get to them, like the fasting, like the charity, like the pilgrimage, and other concepts of worships. Elaborate on the word worship itself. Does it mean the exactly only the physical worship you do it at a certain time, in a certain way, or there is a general aspect of it, more broad dimension? The worship in the Arabic language is translated as ibadah. Yes. And the ibadah means anything good you do Beautiful. in order uh, or with the purpose of seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could be as simple as smiling. That's Beautiful. the ibadah. Because you do it because Allah wants people to spread what's good. So as simple as smiling in someone's face that is ibadah, or as alleviating the pains and suffering of others by either uh, wiping on their shoulders and head or feeding them or giving them charity that is ibadah, or by helping others fulfilling their needs so that's why ibadah in islam is a comprehensive word that includes everything that is good your work can be ibadah if you mean good, if it's done sincerely. Your smile is ibadah. So very much everything in your life, from the time you open your eyes in the morning to the time you go to bed, to bed could be ibadah. That's why ibadah is divided into several parts. And it could be individual or something that just good for you but something that is social, that benefits the people around you. And it could be spiritual, where you're meditating or praying, connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or could be physical, such as you do in prayers by having these physical movements up and down, or by bowing, prostrating, bowing, and prostrating and reciting or verses fasting. of the holy book. Exactly, fasting, for yes. example. Fasting is spiritual, but it's also physical because it requires endurance, and it requires that you abstain from eating, drinking. And it could be financial, financial servitude, financial ibadah, where you're paying in charity, whether it is the mandatory required zakah, the alms, or just voluntary charity you give as you can afford to the, to the needy people. Or it could combine all these aspects, the spiritual, financial, physical, such as the pilgrimage when you visit Mecca and there are a lot of physical activities as a matter of fact there is travel involved during that trip that journey there is a lot of supplications which is spiritual a lot of meditation but there is also financial aspect to it because you have to afford it and you have to to pay for uh, yeah, any, uh, slaughtering uh, Something animals I want you to elaborate on too the concept of worship, all the worships in Islam are different from other religions in a way where all of the worships is 
prescribed by God Almighty, Allah himself. It did not come from a creation of a man. The Prophet Muhammad did not determine how the worships. Those was, were revealed to him, or, and he was inspired to tell people that this is what God is expecting from you. It is not him who designed them and enforced them on people. That's different. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. This is summarized in a beautiful verse in the Quran when Allah says, Ala ya'lamu man khalaq wa huwa al khabir. Doesn't he know what he's created? Indeed, he's the most gentle and the most of knowledge. What means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being and he knows what's best for that human being and he knows what's the best way to make that human being connected him, connected to him, Allah. And when he prescribes certain rituals, it is not to impose on him. It is part of his mercy over that human being because Allah is the most Beautiful. merciful and the most gracious. So he knows that this is the best way, the shortest cut for that human being to, to connect, connect to me. Instead of having people a trial and error and do things that are not required and do things that might be harmful. So we know whatever God has recommended and whatever God has guided us to is what's best. This is what he likes. And this is the, the shortest cut to him. So when he tells you five daily prayers, we know that's, that's the best way to connect to him during the day. If you make him six, that's not good. Does that make sense? Same thing. If he tells you, I want you to fast by abstaining from eating, drinking from this time to that time. That's the best way to do it. A lot of people, even during the time of the Prophet والسلام, thought that we want to be good. We want to be devout. So young people with a lot of enthusiasm and zeal got together. So someone said, I vow no more meat eating for the rest of my life. Because I want to show Allah that I am serious. I want to connect to him. And I'm going to give up meat. Someone said, I'm going to give up marriage. I'm not going to marry. And someone said, I'm going to stay up all night and pray. The Prophet ﷺ heard about them. And he told them, you cannot be more righteous than me. Because the Prophet was taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the best example as a role model for all the humanity. So he said, but I do eat meat, and I do marry, and I do sleep and pray up during the night. And that is the right pathway to Allah. The balanced way. The balanced, exactly. You don't want to go to extremes. Islam does not like extremes. It's about moderation. It's about doing it right. And the best way is the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the balanced way. It is the moderate way. And if you follow it right, you cannot err and you cannot deviate. You cannot go astray. It is always about making it easy on human beings. He knows his creation. He knows his creation. And he's the most gentle, the kindest to his creation. And no one can care about his creation more Allah. Such as anyone can care for children, love them more, be more tender to them than the mother and the father. True. No one can be do that. And Allah is more merciful to his creation than the mother is to her own children. So he only wants what's good for them. What makes him happy in this life and the hereafter. And it only makes sense to follow his guidance. He's the maker. He's the manufacturer. So you follow his guidebook in order to survive. It's such like buying a device or driving a car. You operate it according to that manual. You follow the manufacturer manual. If you don't, you void 
you break your warranty, you're responsible on your own. Same thing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You either follow his guidance or you're on your own. I'm sure in your field you've seen a lot. You are an expert in the neurology field. And you see a lot of patients and you see a lot of people who are suffering and they are distant from that spiritual being that they have but they never attended to. And you see some people who are suffering too physically but they have a spiritual dimension that is helping them. Helping them. How, as a doctor, as a physician, and as a spiritual teacher, how do you see that connection? How the spiritual or the worship and the spiritual aspects can help the well-being of the individual and the well-being of the community in general? That's a very good question and it is multifaceted actually. Uh, the first part we need to talk about is the effect of worship on the individual. We're living uh, a very dynamic life, a constantly changing life. What you've done today is different from what you've done two years ago. What you can do on your iPhone now is something that you never could dream of seven years ago, for example. And because of technology, because of rapidly changing environment, we are facing more and more stress. Mm -hmm. A lot of people can handle stress, but many others cannot. And we are under a lot of pressure. And that pressure, that stress is leading to a lot of, or contributing indirectly to a lot of diseases blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, but more importantly, the mental illnesses, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. It appears to me, this is my observation, which has been supported by a lot of scientific studies actually, that the spiritual connection to God is fundamental in the human being's life, something you cannot do without. Basically to maintain the balance because to we're the balance too much toward the physical and, and, and materialistic. Exactly. And it serves as a defense mechanism or as, or as a compensation mechanism. It's a stress reliever, basically. You know, people go to the gym and that helps their stress. But when you go to the mosque, when you pray, you get the same. And a human being is... is a social animal basically I mean you meant to mingle with people by connecting to other people in the mosque by seeing them multiple times a day praying which is praying in congregation as you know is a very important part of our worshiping activities why because you're not only connecting to God individually alone but with others and that by itself, just being around people, feeling that you're not alone living this life, helps in relieving your stress. By connecting to God, feeling that He's supporting you, He's with you, He's showering His mercy in your heart. And that's why even the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said that when he had any hardship, when he felt any stress, he would go and pray. Why? It's time to connect to the Lord. It's an order of God. Absolutely. Exactly. Do get help by praying. Why? Because same thing. When your iPhone needs help, you put it in the charger. You I cannot say it's an iPhone. It looks great. You cannot rely on it. Same thing. You're a great iPhone, but ran out of battery. You're dysfunctional, unfunctional. What do you do? Connect back. When you do that, the stress goes away. And there is, uh, I see this all the time, and, and I can find a difference. People who have like faith handle stress better. And they always rely, oh, I'm sure it happened for a reason. That by itself is a great defense mechanism because it alleviates the anxiety, alleviates the depression. All these things would 
lead to better well-being. When you have that faith and you feel that God is the creator, he's the one who has control over everything, and he's supporting you. He's your friend. He's working for you, and he's making everything surrounds you serve you. Why worry about things anymore? That's true. Right? So you have the big CEO behind you now. You're on his good list. So why do, why do you have to worry? On a different level also, if we talk about the social aspect, when you live according to the guidance of God, who wants you to be a good role model for everyone around you, who wants you to be good to everyone, who considers like being good to others, it's like part of worshiping him. So that encourages you to be a better person, a better citizen, to be a proactively good person in the community, in the society. And that's what builds a great society. Back again to the worship and its effects on the human being. There are many facets of worship in Islam and they affect the human being, soul and uh, even his physical being differently. We want to talk about the virtue of elevating the human being, making him a better creature on earth and better creature in the sight of his creator. So the elevation, the tazkiyah, if you will. Would you please elaborate on this a little bit for us? Sure. Uh, that's a very important aspect of ibadah, of worship in Islam. The example of the human soul, the heart or the mind, it's just the example of having a backyard. That backyard needs to be maintained. If you ignore it, if you neglect it, it will be invaded by weeds, by bugs, and it will be something uh, you don't want to look at, something very unpleasant. In order to have a good backyard, you need to mow your lawn, you need to have weed and feed, you need to have weed out the uh, things you don't want and you have to trim, keep, trim and groom yeah. and clean. It's a lot of work, Constant a lot of work, work. Yes. exactly. The human being soul is constantly exposed to distractions, constantly exposed to evil. This is a reality of life. This is the way this whole world about, okay? So it constantly requires your attention to weed out the evil from that soul and to grow the virtues. That is the very essence of the concept of tazkiyah, purification. Purify the soul. What does that mean? Growing its virtues and eliminating or eradicating the evils that could affect the soul. If there is a good virtue, someone who's kind, has good conduct, we want to encourage it. We want to train that person to get even better. If someone has some bad characteristics, bad attributes, for example, envy, anger, Arrogance, these are bad characteristics and they need to be eliminated. How That's is that the weeding done? process. That's the weeding process. So weed and feed. Great. You weed out the evil attributes and encourage and grow the good attributes. Beautiful. And this is what God wants. God doesn't want to see weeds in your soul. As a matter, you want you will not enter the kingdom of God with weights. Beautiful point, entering the kingdom of, of God. All of that is a preparation to enter the kingdom of exactly. God. Exactly, because people of paradise are people of virtues who are pure. Allahu Akbar, great. And in order to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be pure. No one will enter paradise with arrogance. This is how the human being was dismissed out of paradise in the first place because of the arrogance of the devil. 
So you cannot, devil did not stay in paradise because of his arrogance. And a human being will not go back to paradise with arrogance. So all that has to be weeded out from the human being, from the soul. How is that done? That's what the ibadah for. Constant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Constant connection, connection to the Lord. Constant humbling yourself between the Lord or in front of the Lord. That what makes you uh, weed the evil attributes out of your soul and purify, uh, purify it and then grow the virtues. This is how you become a better person in the community by living as a humble person without evil attributes. No one can be a perfect human being, but it's a constant process that God wants you to strive for. And if you keep striving, God will grant it for you. That's the tazkiyah, which is one of the most important ingredients of our faith. This is why the Prophet was sent forth to humanity, to teach them the guidance of God, but with emphasis on purifying their souls. By going back to the basics, by reconnecting to the Lord, and by realizing our reality as human beings, we're servants of the Lord, and we should live it as such. We shouldn't be arrogant. We shouldn't be disrespectful to each other. Why? Because we're the same in the sight of God. We're from earth. And all of that can be achieved by the submission to the one and true God. Exactly. And by worshiping Him the way He wanted us to. Beautiful. We'll close with that. And hopefully we come back and talk about every worship by itself and its effect and how it can help you in that path of tazkiyah, of elevation and purification. We want to thank you for being with us today and we look forward to other programs where you can be with us and talk to us about the spiritual dimension in worship in Islam. Very good, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamid, and thank you for watching, and we hope that you benefited from this program in your spiritual journey, and we leave you with the saying, peace be upon you. Oh, yeah. احضنيني وعلمي سرا في عالي سأناجي الله ربي ذا الجلال بخضوعي ونجومي وسؤالي بخضوعي ونجومي